Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so, so as you probably saw in the email, uh, Victor recently got the Outstanding Contribution Award from ACM SIG Mobile. Uh, this is sort of equivalent to a Lifetime Achievement Award. So this is a pretty big deal. And so this was um, uh, awarded to him at uh, ACM Mobicom, which uh, happened just uh, a few weeks ago um, in Florida, in Miami. And uh, it's a very, very nice globe. Uh, I recommend you all stop by Victor's office and, and pick it up and have a look at it. It's, it's, really, it's really beautiful. Or get their own. <laughs> or, or get their own, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, here's a list of the past recipients of the OCA from SIG Mobile. Uh, you will notice a bunch of people that, that you know in there. Very young crowd. Very young crowd, indeed, as, as Stefan points out. Um, so um, Victor um, got the award for pioneering contributions to wireless internet broadband technologies and for inspirational leadership of the mobile computing community. Uh, there, was, um, there was some discussion about whether that pioneering word should be impactful or pioneering. I think in the end, um, uh, pioneering is, is what, what is on his award. Now, you all know Victor quite well. Um, here's his uh, background. Uh, he got his PhD from UMass Amherst. And uh, he worked at uh, this company called DEC, which uh, apparently most of our interns don't know uh, what it was. <laughs> uh, hoping, we're hoping most of you do. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, of course, you know his, uh, his history here in, uh, in uh, MSR. And um, he's been very active in the SIG Mobile community. Uh, he, of course, is a founder of SIG Mobile, as well as a bunch of um, conferences uh, that are part of SIG Mobile or affiliated with SIG Mobile. And he's been on a variety of uh, steering committee uh, positions as well. His, uh, his main contributions have been in uh, broadband wireless, in particular in white space networking and in wireless lands and mesh networking. Um, there, there are a lot of, lot of details you can find, uh, of course, on his webpage here, a bunch of um, highlights on, on some of the work. And of course, Victor's going to go into some detail about uh, his contributions here and how those came about. And of course, you know, uh, he's uh, collected a large number of awards uh, over the years. Um, and there's, uh, there's a long, long list of them. Here's, uh, here's some of the main highlights. Um, and, uh, and I think you know quite a lot of these um, um, from, from all the press that he's gotten from them. He's also gotten lots of uh, accolades. Uh, these are you know, descriptions of uh, some of the words that, Victor, uh, that people have used to describe either Victor or his contributions. Um, so uh, I'd like to present to you Victor, and uh, he will give his, uh, his talk now. Thanks, Sharon. OK, uh, as I was, uh, you know, as you know, this talk was uh, first given at uh, uh, Mobicom. It was given on October 2nd, and that's significant, as you will see as I go through this, to go through the talk. So I was thinking about what to say uh, to this audience. I was. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I thought about whether to just do sort of a future talk or, or, or just uh, do some technical talk. And in the end, I decided that um, I, in many of my um, uh, sort of travels and when I talk to people, they, they generally ask me, how do you, you know, how do you select your problems and, you know, how do you move forward and how do you execute on it? So I thought maybe that's what I'll focus on uh, today. So the topic is me and my research. And I joined... Uh, Microsoft in uh, June of 1997. I was, uh, um, you know, a newly minted PhD. I'd been working in DEC for, for several years, and um, both Rick and Rich recruited me here to uh, start up the networking research group, and they uh, promised me a land of flexibility and openness, and they delivered. So I. When I looked at MSR, it was fairly intimidating. There were uh, people like Gordon Bell, Chuck Thacker, Butler Lamson, you know, all these Turing Award winners. And uh, they were collecting these uh, amazing researchers. And um, so it was a little bit intimidating, but it was also very exciting. And so I was, as I was thinking through uh, what, you know, what to do here, I met Turner Whithead. And Turner uh, recently uh, left MSR. 
but uh, he's a great guy. He's actually also sort of god of graphics, and he gave me this article by Hamming. And many of you may have read the article, and the article said, you and your research. And I see some uh, shaking hands. People have people not read this article if, or not read it, I would think. So great, this is the audience. If you haven't read it, you should read it. This is uh, actually a transcript of a colloquium he gave at Bell Labs in which he was asked, or he, he, thought, he talked about why do some scientists make it big and some don't? And what, is, what in particular do they have that causes them to win or do great things? And he, he lists out uh, very nicely all the different things, but one thing that struck me when I read the article was this, uh, this thing about courage, about having the courage to go and ask the questions and, and do things which others uh, may not do, may be fearful of. So this talk is then about a young systems researcher at the time uh, wanting to be courageous. It's about wanting to imp have impact and then uh, potentially sharing some of the things that I've learned over the course of my career uh, over a certain time. Now, in order to do this, I do have to leave some modesty aside because I will be talking about things that, that worked and I, I, I uh, ask your forgiveness for that. So let's start with uh, uh, how I started. So when I joined in 97, the state of wireless networking was not like it is today, of course. Uh, there, were, there was no Wi-Fi, there was no standards. The IEEE 11 standard was just coming about. Uh, there were very few companies. There was no Arubas, there was no Broadcom selling anything or Symbol or, well, Symbol was selling something, but uh, all the companies that you know didn't exist at the time. And then most of the wireless networking were done with these cards. In fact, if you come to my office, I have some of these still in my, in my uh, file cabinet <laughs> that I can show you. And the cost of these things were about $300 a piece. Now, uh, in terms of the community itself, there was really no home. And in fact, I had just started SigMobile uh, just as I was entering MSR. So it was a very, very brand new community and, um, you know, who, who, which, where the home just started. The home just started. <laughs> so I was this new guy in town. And uh, uh, so the question was, uh, I wanted to obviously create an impression. So what do I do? I, I thought of building a lab. And so then I had this idea that why not turn Building 31, which was the place where MSR existed, into a, a full lab and pursue research at scale there. The question was, how do I do that? Who is going to give me resources for it? So the first lesson is, when you, if you have big ideas, you want to do it, find an individual who, has, who is forward-looking, who can support you, and who will uh, be willing to, to help you uh, move your thing. And for me, that individual was Dan Ling. Dan Ling is now uh, uh, you know, retired, but uh, I give him a lot of credit for what MSR is today uh, in terms of um, the successes of MSR. OK, so then with that support, I settled on going to this company called Airnet Wireless. And then um, the question then for me was, OK, I'll deploy the network, but then I needed to program it too. And without programming, it would be just be a network. But I wanted to do that as well. And it turned out that uh, Windows did not understand wireless at the time. There was no way for me to program uh, any of the wireless cards. So what do you do? You're a researcher. You want to do this. Well, you can go to a device driver and get the device drivers, which I did. But then how do you do this in scale? How do you make sure that everybody is using your work? Okay. So then. Uh, I thought, hmm, let me uh, write something that we'd always do. We write a paper. So I wrote this paper. I wrote a paper called Wireless is Not Ethernet. And uh, I gave justifications of why that is the case. Did, I did some lab experiments, showed all that stuff, and gave it to uh, the product groups. Well, the product groups sort of saw it and kind of ignored it. And uh, if you're smiling, you probably have some examples of your own in this category. So the lesson is that if you want people to spend their time on your idea, you must show them the money first. There are more, more lessons, but let's, let's go with that for now. So, so I came back, and I thought, what can I do that is compelling that would get 
these guys to listen to me mm -hmm. and be, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, understand that this is important. So at that time, if, if uh, you you work in location determination field, uh, Roy and and uh, uh, Andy Andy Hopper had uh, Olivetti Labs, and they had done some really good work on IR batch location uh, location determination with this active batch batches thing. But there was nothing in the RF space, which is what I was looking for. Now, I had done some work before coming to Microsoft Research. I had done work in the same space and written a paper, uh, which was published in, in JSAC uh, a while ago. So I looked at that paper, and then after looking at it for a long time and deciding that I would, whether to, to implement it or not, decided it was just too complicated. It was so complicated. It was one of the best papers I wrote because it was very, very mathematically intensive. It had all the stuff that I knew about signal processing and control theory in it, Kalman filtering, state space, all the good stuff. But it was difficult for me even to understand after I'd written it and looking back at it for a while. So you must think about simplest solutions. Now, so then I thought, okay, what should I do next? Now, I had seven, eight years of uh, background in signal processing. I had done pattern recognition work uh, quite a bit. Uh, before I uh, uh, got to Microsoft, and in fact, in DEC, I had done a lot of image processing. That's where uh, I, had be, I was coming from. So now, uh, I work with this great new hire, Venkert, at the time, that, who had we just hired. He was, in fact, he was the first hire for the uh, networking group. And uh, with him, started to think about pattern recognition, context, uh, uh, pattern recognition in the context of RS signals. And naturally from that, the, uh, the answer was, was there a pattern to the signals that you saw at any particular location? And so went down that path, and then radar was created. And so uh, there's actually this, this demo, if you click, if you go to the radar uh, web page and you click on it, you can actually see how the original radar system worked. It was 1999. Now, so the lesson here was that some of the best work in my mind is done when you actually have ideas in a particular field and then you reapply them in a different field because you, this is a very fresh outlook to, to applying the same ideas and, and they win. Now, so, so uh, Rito was an enormous success. I don't know if you've gone and seen, it is one of, one of the highest uh, side paper I have. If I look at the combination of, uh, I, uh, if we go to Google Scholar and look at it, there's more than 6,200 six, uh, 6, citations for that particular paper. So, it's really successful, but that was in 1999, today is 2013, and where are the products today? There's no products still, right? So research success does not mean commercial success. For commercial success, you must think really hard about the value proposition. So when I went and, and tried to sell radar to our product groups, they said um, that uh, they didn't see the value uh, in terms of uh, uh, the amount of effort that had to be placed to find the location versus what you would do with it. Now, of course, there were other reasons there too. At that time, they, we didn't have smartphones at that time. We only had laptops and things like that. So there were many reasons. But, but just to tell you, the, the guys in product groups are very pragmatic, very practical. They know what works. And so I didn't have a really good value proposition, and I didn't have it for many years. So I just abandoned that. I didn't do, I actually did not write a single paper after that, even though, as you can see, there were 6,000 papers or more written after that. Now, so one other lesson was to persevere. I mean, if you're doing research, you're probably way ahead. And if you're way ahead, you're not going to convince people right away to take your stuff. Okay? And then the other thing that I learned was that the market will always, always take the simplest solution. So even though I had done radar and I thought it was much simpler than the one that I had done, the paper that I had done previously, it was not as simple as what Skyhook, Sky, uh, Skyhook Wireless did. And if you know what Skyhook Wireless did, all they did was that they looked at the location of the access point and said that's where your location is. And that was it. And they created a whole table lookup and a whole uh, class and they, they sold. They made lots and lots of money. The iPhone, when it first came out, had Skyhook in it. And that was a degenerate case of radar. And I had completely overlooked it. Right? So, so that was sort of an interesting thing for me. Now, um, uh, if I, I want to show you a little video that uh, I did in 1999, which was shown by Rick at Mobicom 1999, and then we showed this one Next in. Uh, Turn left. Conference room number 2133. Yeah, maybe, is 12 feet. But this is Sharad. This was done about uh, about a year and a half ago. Oh, God, a few ago. minutes before my presentation. Uh, doing radar-like functionality, and this was done in 1999. And it'll just uh, say a few things.
with radar, we can build location-aware systems and services. Uh, once radar knows what your physical location is, it can provide that information to the system, and the system can do interesting Sorry. things for you. I mean, for example, on your you, you know, there's a story. There's a story behind the beard. The, the thing is, I was kind of, I was pretty young looking, and I was heading Sigma Ball, and I needed to look old. So the beard was there for, for me to look old. All right. So um, anyway, so this is uh, this radar uh, for. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 14 years ago. Yeah, 14 years ago. So now, uh, back to my endless extension story. Well, I had done radar, and I had now uh, gone in and understood what the product groups wanted. So then I had an intern, Gavin. He was one of my first interns, and we sat down and wrote a spec down. We wrote the spec just like you would see a product group spec. This was not a paper. It was not a spec. And when we went there, and we presented the spec, and we showed them the value at the time, uh, and, the, and then the, that virus indeed was different, and you could never do what I had done with Ethernet, they got it. They got it, and they accepted it. So now, and they started to have wireless LAN extensions. And not just that, they actually started a huge program called Native Wi-Fi after that, which was to completely abstract out the wireless part uh, from Windows and take most of it in, its, in, in the stack above. And that was fairly successful as well. So that was all good. Now, this is a, a memo that I wrote uh, to, uh, with an MSR, and I actually blew it up a little bit. Uh, and uh, I thought it was sort of funny. This, the, this was about the building that I had talked to you about, creating, the, uh, creating building 31 into a wireless network uh, uh, lab. And of course, you know, send this memo out to all of MSR, saying that we have full wireless access, encouraging them to use wireless, which is something that you don't even like, think about now. We just take it for, for granted. But at that time, people were not like that. You sort of had to encourage them. And then uh, I talked about AirNet and uh, the cost of uh, adapter. Now, this took a momentum of its own. So after MSR did this, after we did this in MSR, they, uh, we used to have this thing called Micronews. I don't know how many of you still, well, some of you know about Micronews, but many of you don't potentially know. But we actually had a, had a paper Micronews that would just show up like every week or so. And in there, in there, uh, Bill Gates announced that we were going to uh, unwire all 45 buildings of Microsoft uh, in it. And then he, in, here, he, in there, he says, sort of, uh, uh, is aimed at spurring other companies to take steps to use technology to free what Gates calls knowledge workers. This was a huge deal in the wireless community because this was the first company with that kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, spread and, and, and uh, deep pockets that were saying wireless was going to be the future. And if you remember that company that I talked about, Airnet, well, Airnet got bought for $800 million right there. And I believe that a lot of what happened in Wi-Fi, the boost that happened was because of this, and then they made a whole lot of money here. So the point here is that it is very difficult to actually, I could never have imagined this would happen. And it's difficult to sort of see when you start your project what they will, where they will lead. So don't worry so much about about the big things. The little things will get you there so long as your vision is large enough and big enough. OK, so good successes in the enterprise. So why not take it outside? Well, this was a time when 3G networks were very, very popular. And everywhere you went, every uh, place, every uh, uh, newspaper article, or every um, you know, magazine looked at, 3G networks were going to solve all the things. We were called in panel discussions where it's wireless uh, wars, Wi-Fi versus 3G. I mean, now you can sort of think about that's silly and stupid, but that's the time when the telcos were very pushing. And the telcos did not want wireless LAN uh, in the public spaces because they thought it would eat into their existing businesses. So the point here is that what you read in popular media, you should take it with a grain of salt. You need to be independent thinkers. Uh, they will get it wrong because they are just listening to a lot of marketing stuff that is happening, and, and we are trained not to do that and think independently. So I didn't, and uh, I built uh, the Choice Network, uh, which was then the first Wi-Fi network in the world. And uh, Rich remembers this probably because uh, he was backing this up uh, quite, quite a lot. But there's a poster that is still in my office, and we had this poster. And in the Crossroads shopping center that we have here, we had the first Wi-Fi hotspot network in the world. And, uh, and this, this page actually still exists, although this morning when I tried to load it, it wasn't loading properly. Now, there was lots of great innovation in here, by the way. This was not just 
just the fact that we put wireless cards in there. We had to decide what the architecture would be. So one of the big architecture design decisions that I made at that time was to have smart wireless switches and dumb access points. Okay? That, was, that was a design decision. But all the other good stuff that you hear about in the, in the conferences and stuff was there. Location-aware services was there, all this other stuff. Security was there. And, um, and it's, sort of, uh, it's, it's uh, um, uh, sort of articulated in this paper that I had. Now, once I had built this, I was out there uh, uh, evangelizing. And the way I would evangelize this, um, you know, logically was, here's a graph from a Hotnets conference, the panel that I was sitting in 2002, where I sort of showed, okay, let's look at where I spent my time. So on the horizontal axis is the days of the week and the number of hours spent. And as you can see, it sort of divides up into hotels, flights, airports, offices on the move home. But now if you map this to saying how much of it is indoors and how much of it is outdoor, this is what shows up. So you're spending majority of your time indoors. And this, to me, was a convincing argument to say that wireless Wi-Fi access and wireless LANs was the future. And I couldn't see why people wouldn't see that and why I was actually making that argument in the thing. But that's how um, I, did, I did this. Now, the, the uptake, of course, is that hundreds of thousands of wireless uh, hotspots exist. In fact, it is almost impossible to even determine how many are there in the world. And we just expect them everywhere. But for me, it wasn't a successful thing. Right? It wasn't successful because the, when I had gone to the product groups and you would ask the question, why didn't Microsoft pick up and do something with it? I did. I actually did try to push it inside. They didn't get it. They were very busy in what they were doing. Uh, then, in fact, the architecture that I had recommended, the FAT AP, uh, uh, the sort of, um, you know, they uh, embraced an alternative architecture where they put the, the, the most of the logic in the access points and not in the wireless uh, switches. And as you can see, in retrospect, the world is where uh, I was uh, then, which is that the architecture is much more in the wireless switches than in the APs. And then when I submitted a paper to Mobicom, the reviewers came back with all kinds of small little things here and there, and they rejected it. And I was dejected, and I said, screw it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend my time uh, uh, trying to sort of move forward with it. So the lesson here, again, is that if you really believe in it, you need to persevere. And yes, you may be wrong, but you may be right too, okay? I, I moved on, I look back at some of the mistakes, this was one of the mistakes I did. Now, uh, seven years after that, so one thing we did do, of course, is we patented all the, all the good stuff. Now you sometimes wonder what happens to our patents. You've heard all the, all the stories in, in terms of Google and Motorola, but really in this particular case, I did get an email uh, in 2007, which was about seven years after I had done this work, saying that they had made an agreement, a landmark agreement with Nortel, and was sort of based on the patents that we had done for, for, that, for those networks. And it goes on and says you know, good things about it. So Microsoft did, did do, uh, get some win out of it, but not as much as I'd hoped and they would get. OK, so, so this was about uh, some lessons I was learning. But as I was learning, I was actually applying them too. So in 2002, we uh, interviewed Ranveer. Uh, he's not here, but he was there when I gave this talk originally. And uh, he was a, a PhD student at Cornell. He had come in for the MSR fellowship, and he was talking about ad hoc networking. Anyway, I liked his drive. I liked his enthusiasm, and I, I loved him. So I took him on as, as actually my prodigy at the time. And then, so together uh, with my brother, who was in the product groups, we worked on this thing called Multinet. And then we built the real thing. Now, it was all you know, a kernel hack in the Windows. It was all built. It worked really well. But as usual, it was ignored by the business group. So in this particular case, did not move on. So we persevered, right? We persevered, and we shipped it to the world, which is we said, we, are going, we so believe in this, we're going to make this all available. And this became one of the lar fastest downloaded software from Microsoft Research. 100,000 uh, of, uh, of the uh, downloads happened in a very short period of time. And then in 2009, seven years afterwards, it finally shipped as virtual Wi-Fi inside Windows. And this was the first virtual, Windows virtualization architecture um, that, that, that we sell. So the lessons that were applied here, we built a real thing, we showed them the money, and we persevered. Okay. Now, my third story starts with, uh, with a Chinese dinner. So uh, I was an uh, uh, and Craig Mendy, who was uh, the CTO uh, of, of Microsoft. I got this mail from Pierre Duvis, and some of you might remember him also. And the, uh, the email went like this. Victor, Craig would like to get your input 
on what is feasible Mac protocol. And I'm thinking to myself, what the heck? Uh, a CTO of Microsoft asking me about a Mac protocol? Didn't seem very smart. But anyway, he sort of says, well, we can meet in this Chinese restaurant in Redmond, and he wants to meet it, come now. Basically, that's what it said. So, okay, so I said, fine. I showed up on that day, and that's the day when I got my first exposure to some of these topics. So I, I, from Craig, I started to understand and, and imagine uh, my, uh, my uh, sort of mindset at that time. I was this researcher in a research lab uh, doing things, and now I was suddenly exposed by the CTO of the company to much, much bigger problems in society. One of the problems being that uh, there was no internet access in rural areas while we were all we had it. Another was that I didn't really know was there was a duopoly of internet access between cable and DSL. And that duopoly was a serious uh, impediment to, to the progress that we wanted to see. I also learned from him about network neutrality. And then I also learned uh, there was a, a, a very good looking lobbyist in that dinner table. I didn't know what uh, a person did, but I learned that she was a lobbyist and then uh, what they do in Washington, DC. And I actually started to, uh, get it. That was sort of a watershed moment for me in terms of the work we do on MSR is not just about products, it's not just about uh, doing papers, but it is about, can be about something b much bigger. So the problem that was placed in front of me, the technical problem that was placed in front of me is that we needed to become a threat to the cable and DSL because the, the resolution was that if the cable and DSL guys knew that there was an alternative, then they would try to protect the turf, and the way they would protect it is potentially go out and become even more pervasive. So the idea was, how do we become a threat to them, but we can't break the bank? So it was, the, the solution wasn't that we just go and dig fiber and uh, do what Google is doing today, but you know, how, do we, how do we get there? So, and in the meantime, so you know, I, I got on the bandwagon, and I also sort of realized that this problem was real about rural networks. And, and as you sort of dug, and I also gave a lot of talks on this, there were some famous quotes by Kofi Annan, who was the General Secretary of UN, and, and Richard Newton, who was, who was passed away. Uh, dean of UC Berkeley was also a member of our tab. And you know, they, and, and uh, me too, were going out and sort of talking about this thirst for connection that needed to bridge this notion of digital divide. And if you remember, for those who were around there, there was this whole digital inclusion, digital divide uh, a thing that we were pushing very hard, which was about uh, bringing uh, more people uh, into, the, into the mix. So mesh networking emer emerged. The idea there was this was going to be an organic system where, uh, remember, we didn't want to spend that much money, so we wanted the people to, to spend the money, and they wa we wanted them to uh, buy their equipment, and then through the magic of software, we were just going to connect them. And then we would bring fiber or cable or something in some middle place, and then through this multi-hub network, connect it to that, and boom, they will have internet access. So that's what we wanted to do. That was what mesh networking was all about. And so the group really, really jumped into this. And uh, uh, Rich was actually a, a core uh, a part of that uh, group. And uh, we, we just took it by the throat and, and jumped on doing mesh networking. Now, you know, you would expect, I mean, I expected, being, being in the field, that there were 20 years of research that had happened in this area. And so it, this would be easy. This would be just an engineering job because people had written thousands of papers on the subject. So why would it be difficult? Wrong. It was wrong. So I looked at the number of routing protocols existed, and I ran out of steam. I couldn't fill this slide. But there were so many. So the question in front of you, if you were in engineering or a product team, is which one should you pick? The interesting point was that every one of them showed improvement over the other one that they had looked at. And the only reason was, and you will, you will understand that in research, we kind of tend to do that. Well, maybe not we, but you know, people tend to do that, which is, Change, change the assumption here a little bit, or change something here, and then make the graph go in the right direction. And boom, you have a paper. And so, what do you do? Well, this was uh, very difficult. As researchers, it was difficult for us, uh, let alone product groups. And that's one of the reasons why, when product groups, when you sort of say, I have a good solution, the product groups are sort of a little confused because they're hearing 20 different things, and they really don't know what to trust. And, and uh, you, you know why that is here. So I, I, too, lost a bunch of faith in the academic uh, research community, in the networking community. At that was the time, I went from a phase that they were very smart people to people who were just writing papers, okay, without knowing. Now, 
And, and Mobicon, which is the home audience uh, uh, in the, in the uh, you know, big conference of the time and still is, was becoming too academic. And so we needed a systems conferences where we act, we, we researchers build real systems. And that was a time when I founded uh, Mobisys in 2003. Now, so, so I think that one thing as system researchers, and I, I believe this group is very good at it, it's world class and top notch and role models in it, but I do believe there are not that many people like this, which is that we need to take our work to the point of irrefutability. We need to take it to the point where there is no question that it actually works in all kinds of environments and, uh, that, that you're aiming at. So we were very successful, I thought. We, we produced these uh, academic kits. We wrote a lot of software. We gave the software away. We wrote papers. We did talks. And you know, there were 1,200 universities worldwide who started using our kit. So by all sense and form, this was a success. We organized summits and <coughs> workshop. And then looking at the energy that we were putting into this thing, the community also started to sort of got invigorated because uh, multi-hub ad hoc networking has been an intellectually interesting uh, uh, problem space. And there are many, many hundreds of papers were being used. And then the VC dollars started to flow as well. So, you know, just like Internet of Things is happening now. VC dollars, you know, they see money and they say, what the heck, you know, 100,000 here or a million there for, for somebody who has $100 million is not such a big deal. And they started to spend and immediately you started to see all these news things about New Orleans will have free citywide Wi-Fi or, or Michigan will have or Philadelphia will have. And there was a whole bunch of these things. Now, so we had succeeded. We had become a credible threat to the DSL and cable monopoly. And in the process, we had actually introduced some really, really good concepts which have stood the test of time. And one of them was uh, multi-radio wireless networks. And, uh, we, do, we were the first to write papers on that and sort of explain how they worked well. Now, the reality is that it was not so successful as you look back, right? All the good stuff that was coming started to become bad. San Francisco formerly and citywide, AT&T kills. So, the point was that the VCs got it wrong. They did not understand the technology. They did not understand that the limitations. And so when uh, you know, people who wanted to make quick money in startups gave them the spiel and told them, hey, look, Microsoft is doing it, they just went with it and spent a whole lot of money and then realized they were not getting any money back for various technical problems, which I can go into, but won't now. And so, they, did, they, they didn't do very well. And so the, the, the lesson again here is that uh, businesses' decisions that are made on uh, you know, not understanding the technologies are bad decisions to make. And this applies to us as Microsoft as a company as well, which is that we must be very honest with ourselves when we build a technology and we go talk to somebody else how real it is. Again, this goes back to the point of irrefutability. It's a point of that you are completely satisfied that this is, will work then you put your weight behind it. Otherwise, there's more work to do. They got it wrong. They didn't really understand this, okay? So my fourth story is around licensed versus unlicensed. Now, <clears throat> this um, also uh, uh, goes back to uh, 2003, uh, when I had the first exposure to the breadth and complexity of the issues involved in, in all of this stuff. So, Everyone wanted more spectrum, just like now. If you're in wireless and you can go to your favorite uh, search engine and check, you know, everybody says, oh, spectrum crunch and it's not going to happen or whatever. Now, the debate is whether we should give it to the telcos or should we do it unlicensed. And there's reason to do both, right? Because the telcos will come and say, look at it. Look at our cell phone industry. Look how, how amazingly successful it is, how many people use it, how much economic value we have created because of that, and we can do it right. The unlicensed guys will come and say, look at Wi-Fi, like, look at Bluetooth, look at Zigbee. These are really successful. This would not have happened with unlicensed. So if you sort of think about it, there's all these issues. Now, this is the time when I uh, learned about uh, Ronald Coase. He was a British economist. Uh, he's passed away. He was also a, a Nobel laureate. And he's called the father of reform in the spectrum allocation policies. Uh, does anybody know about him? So that's OK, because when I asked in the Mobicom audience, does anybody know about it? Not anybody knew about him. And so uh, it was sort of sad to me, because I think these are, uh, uh, these are history is important, because uh, you sort of learn. So what he had done is he had written a very scathing article about the FCC. What the FCC had done, just so you know, is uh, uh, all this broadcast spectrum was very political at the time. And so uh, 
they had uh, these these politicians were also very rich a long time back, and so there was some sort of deal made where the spectrum was given away to these broadcasters, which are now broadcasters, uh, um, for free. And the, one of the reasons was because uh, these broadcasters would broadcast political speeches and things, so they would help the political agenda of the people. So the, there was there was this uh, ulterior motive in giving it to them free. And so when he looked at this problem, this was uh, in the 50s, I think. He, he wrote this you know, a huge paper and sort of saying how wrong this was and how badly they had sort of uh, looked at all this stuff. Anyway, I was invited to, uh, to Stanford. And there was a workshop that was organized by uh, Larry Lessig and uh, Thomas Hazlitt. Uh, they, are, uh, they, are, uh, you know, they are lawyers, but they are also great thinkers. Uh, and, and I would recommend, uh, if you're interested, to sort of uh, look at their uh, or become a fan of their tweeting, which I do. But uh, they brought in a whole lot of uh, forward-looking thinkers, economists, uh, 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 legal scholars, uh, everybody to this, this workshop. And I badly wanted to be there. I badly wanted to be there. I wanted to learn beyond my engineering. So if you want to be there, you must bring something to the table. OK? You, so I did. I actually wrote a draft proposal on what is spectrum etiquette. And uh, I worked pretty hard on this one because uh, I was working with some, some parameters about what etiquette meant. And I went there. They gave me a stage to present my work, and I promptly rejected it. They probably rejected it. Etiquette made no sense in spectrum. But, I had, but, but at least I had started the dialogue. Anyway, so what was happening there was, uh, at that time, uh, uh, you know, I became aware that in 1996, the US Congress was going to open up all these TV bands. right? And uh, at, at stake was what happens to these, uh, to these bands. So the idea of dynamic spectrum access was in the air, but it was all just in the air. These lawyers and these uh, 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 you know, um, policy thinkers and regulators were not engineers. They could only talk about things. They couldn't do it. And they were making a lot of assumptions. So somebody had to prove that this thing works. And we did. So we came back, and we worked on this problem. We worked on the dynamic spectrum access pro problem, and we built the first white space network in the world. And so these are some pictures of the time. And once we built it, we knew that we, people were going to listen to us, and that's exactly what happened. These are pictures of uh, the chairman of the FCC who came here on a Saturday, and I gave him a two and a half hour talk and answered every question he had. And uh, he came in with his, uh, you know, his chief of staff and some engineering. And he asked me very pointed questions about things. We showed him the demo, everything. And at the end, he sort of went back. And I believe, and uh, there's really no evidence to, to, to back this up, uh, except the fact that he was there a month later. They, they announced that, um, that they were going to open these bands up for unlicensed spectrum with DSA. Now, this, of course, led to a lot of regulators all over the world who were interested in this as well. And so they came here, and we showed it to everybody. We showed it to you know, IEEE standard bodies uh, folks. We showed it to, uh, of course, the FCC from India, from Singapore. All these regulators came here. Now, and also, the good news was that beyond doing all this stuff, I also got to be a part of the PhD thesis of at least two students. And I'm sure there were a lot more. But these were directly a consequence of the work that we did here, because they got these two theses at Harvard and UMD. What we had, what we had gone from was this world. On the horizontal axis is the range in meters. Vertical axis is the speed. And then if Wi-Fi, for example, sits here, and then these are the, some of the different technologies, to a world that looks like this. So we had literally created a new world where we could start to think about what kind of scenarios we could enable. And that's what it uh, looked like. So what I learned there was that, again, the work that MSR lets us afford to do can actually goes well beyond what we think it is, right? So in order to succeed, I had to think about the society. I had to make the case based on society. I had to understand what the business needs were, right? We had to sort of think about, of course, research engineering and regulation policy. And all these things sort of fit together to solve that particular problem. So research is only one part of the story. And so when we do some work, and if you may have heard Peter talk about it, if you do some work, we must have a sense of humor about what we have done as opposed to what actually happens. Building an idea, because we, we have the luxury to do it, 
it's just not enough. You really have to think about the whole thing. And you have to, if you believe in it, go down. And if you don't, and if somebody else is doing that, then you must give him or her uh, the same accolade and perhaps more for taking the risk to actually take it to the end, which you couldn't. So anyway, the point is that this is a lot more to solving a problem than just uh, doing your own papers, et cetera. So we've had uh, you know, plenty of impact beyond Microsoft. I, I want you to read this. This came uh, you know, just uh, out of the blue for us, but it was really heartwarming. And I'll just uh, take 10 seconds off for you to actually read this. So you can imagine what, what uh, we sort of did or what this technology did to this individual sitting somewhere. And I'm, I, I have to believe that there are a lot more than just this person who's actually benefiting from it. And so this is great because we are actually doing something, uh, something amazing. So let me show you this, uh, this video just to sort of break the things up a little bit and also make a point. <laughs> What if you could better educate children living in a remote village who lack access to specialized instruction? What if you could manage traffic so gridlock doesn't stop your city during rush hour? What if you could provide state-of-the-art high-tech medical care to people living in remote communities? What if governments could use technology to better deploy city services such as garbage removal and reduce costs in the process? What if a boy who dreams of playing in the Premier Leagues could finally stream his favorite team's games? If you look for the answers, you won't find them in what's out there. But you might find them in what's not there. It's called white space, and it's a renewable natural resource found in unused radio frequencies. These unused white space frequencies can be used to increase available bandwidth, improving the quality of broadband connectivity. And lots of these unused frequencies are located between TV channels. Signals sent out on these unused TV frequencies travel far and penetrate trees, walls, and other solid objects, inexpensively extending the reach of Wi-Fi and other wireless broadband technologies currently limited to using higher frequencies. What can TV white spaces enable? You can manage traffic in your city minute to minute, adapting the infrastructure to accommodate conditions. You can more efficiently deliver public services. You can have medical resources be available for preventive care. By reducing the cost of broadband connectivity, a school can now become part of the global village. The only thing stopping this from happening is the lack of favorable, consistent regulations allowing white space technology to be deployed on an unlicensed or license-exempt basis. People and the devices they use will finally be better connected by tapping into the TV white space available in your country. Okay, so this is a, a marketing video, of course, but I, I, I showed it because there was this last point that I wanted to sort of help me transition into what I'm gonna say next which is the last thing. So, you know, people often ask me, okay, you know, uh, about a vision talk, and I don't know, uh, I don't think I'm a visionary or anything like that, but I always see a whole lot of problems that we need to solve, and the question is, which one are we gonna solve it? So now, in this particular case, I will um, tell you about this thing called the PCAST report, and I don't know how many of you know it, but PCAST stands for, uh, it's a presidential commission. Uh, which was uh, put together by the Obama uh, government to look at the future of the United States and the world and think about what is going to happen with mobile technologies. And they uh, brought in world ex well, experts from all over the world, and it's a big report, and you, know, you can read it if you want. But one of the things they did say was that the way the FCC has sort of dealt with Spectrum was all messed up, and the norm has to be sharing. And they kind of sort of leave it at that, that it has to be sharing. Now, the question for us as engineers is, uh, can we build technology that allows sharing? And um, so you know, that's sort of a challenge. So this uh, brings me to the kinds of things that I am uh, working on. Um, these are just a subset of the things that I work on. But um, you know, there's a campus-wide spectrum. And, and the reason I'm working on some of these is that last part in the video, which is that you have to build it to prove to the regulators around the world that it works. And so 
building it means not building it in your lab. Doesn't mean building it, you know, in, in some sort of a, a rural setting. You have to build it mainstream, and that's what we're doing here. We're building a DSA network mainstream to show that there's, we have irrefutable evidence that it works. Now, uh, we are also going to make this available to the research uh, community as well as uh, uh, pushing very hard on different universities to build it as well. And then uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about this in the end. So this is the network, and you, uh, many of you may have seen the guy. This is a SORA board from MSR Asia. These are some of the antennas in Building 19. There are seven antennas here in Building 99 right above. This is where the SORA box sits, and we've got four buildings equipped with it. This is a joint effort between MSR Asia and MSR Redmond. Now, uh, looking at the spectrum crisis thing for, uh, really quickly is there are all these blogs, you know, sort of talk about uh, we are, uh, you know, we are headed for a more serious problem, which is things just won't stop working. And so the question is, can it be managed? Uh, the technical question here is, can it be managed? Now, we, we did some work and we looked at uh, how the spectrum has been used. So this is what the FCC has allocated on the band above. This is what we see, okay? So you can see there's all this allocation, but there's no use. Then how can anybody say that there's not enough spectrum? Right? Of course, this is not a conclusive set of data. We are, we are, we are now uh, taking it upon ourselves to not, again, believe the marketing literature, but to get real data. Science is based on real data. So we're going to get real data to determine if there is actually a spectrum crisis or not. And we're going to show after many, you know, maybe a year or two years, that it, whether it exists or not. It, it tells us that it probably doesn't. So uh, uh, the technology policy group here in Microsoft has actually built a spectrum observatory, but it cost $25,000 in, so it's not scalable. What we have been doing in MSR now is to bring that price down to less than $5,000, and we've got many universities lined up that are going to take this and, and put this observatory. So think of it as a planet lab, but an observatory that has got 1,000 points all over the US and all over the world. And so we, what we want is the call to arm to a lot of the students and a lot of the universities there was to help us build this observatory around the US. So there is no more debate of whether it exists or doesn't exist, and we have real data. So once, and so once we show that there does exist spectrum, then the next technical question is, how do we use it? How do we use that thing that somebody else has been allocated, but you want to use it? So it's sort of like white spaces. White spaces then becomes the first manifestation of it. But you have to build similar systems, and it's not easy. You have to actually think about hardware. You have to think about broadband uh, uh, receivers. You have to think about power. You have to think about rendezvous strategies. A lot of the problems that people have tried to solve uh, actually are much simpler in the Wi-Fi space than, than the space that I'm talking about now. And, and if we, but if we solve them, we would have gotten rid of spectrum crisis forever. So uh, that's really what it is. So I just uh, have a few parting thoughts uh, from a lot of this work that I've done. And so the first one is that we must, must always question the assumptions. Now, when the assumptions were made, they were right. So right now, we make some assumptions about the systems we built. And we are right. You know, we're not uh, stupid people. But the generations that come after us, they would have made a lot of progress. And the question then is that, what the assumptions right or not? So, we must, must always do that. I've also made this point uh, plenty of times, hopefully, which is that uh, research is only useful if you really take it, at least systems research is useful if you take it to the point of refutability. Okay? Then um, I, and this was sort of a controversial topic, a point that I made, actually, because people asked me about this later on, which is I believe publish when you're done. The question is when are you done? But, but that's, we can talk about that, but really, uh, it is a disservice in my mind to publish. In fact, I gave this antidote from my um, uh, wife who's technical and she was working in Amazon. She doesn't work in there anymore. But, and she was uh, doing all this stuff with Hadoop and analytics and uh, all the other uh, good stuff with big data. And she came to me one day and she said, you know, you guys are like, totally messed up because you, you publish so many papers and 90% of them are garbage and you wasted my time. You wasted so much of my time and my people's time. So, and that's just not good. That's just bad for our community, for our service. And so again, back to MSR, we can't, we have to be very, very critical about what we publish, I think. Persevere, that comes out, uh, hopefully has come out in the, in the main things I've sort of said. And then the last one is don't be afraid of failing. Because you're not going to achieve anything, any great, anything great if you don't even try the hard stuff. And I have failed many times for the things that I've shown you. 
I can talk to you about many cases I failed. I told you how I didn't do well in the Wi-Fi. There are other projects also I can talk about. But of course, you don't hear about them. You only hear about the successes. But really, that's, that is uh, exceedingly important. And then you need to have sort of a better thing. So now, um, uh, in ending, I would uh, quote Mahatma Gandhi. I told you I gave this talk on October 2nd. And so uh, it turned out it was Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. And uh, he had said something which also I, I very much believe in. That be very slow to have conviction, but when you have the conviction, you, you, you go for it. With that, I will end, and we are in time. Thank you very much for listening to me so quietly. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so any so we can stop recording, <laughs> <laughs> but we can have a. I think uh, what I uh, what I thought.